ducks are coming. Hello. Oh, look, they're all coming. It's like filming with Mr. Bean. Because I had no idea what a popo was. <laughs> In fact, I'm still not sure. I can't believe you're talking about. We haven't got any food. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you could absolutely do that. And actually, I didn't hear the traffic at all in the church. The pub? Straight up there. Just round that corner on the right. <laughs> we must look like we know where we are. We're doing a show here. Do you know where the pub is? <laughs> Look at them. Look, it's a little duck parade. Welcome to episode 133, and I'm partially happy. Partially happy? Yes, I was extremely happy. Right. But then this morning arrived. Yes. And the temperature went up at least five degrees. Oh, yeah. And I'm not quite so happy. But. No. Coats have been retrieved. Yeah, only light jackets. Yeah, and cowly things. I wore a cowl you on did? new adventures. Yes. You'll see. Yes. Oh, oh, they will already have seen a bit. Oh. And how exciting was that? It only dawned on me, Kay, that, yes, we have. What a show we have in store. We do. Because we have. Literally, although I may have to snip a bit more out of it, so do not miss the gold edition, people, because it, I think we could have done an hour. Yeah, we definitely could have done more. Uh, no, 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 no. More. I think I had footage to edit no, to it. No, that's what I mean. All oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Just because it was so interesting. Absolutely was. Mm. And the reason why I'm sort of so smiley and, and laughing is, did you see the clip? Excuse me, do you know where the pub is? <laughs> You'll that see was it. Excellent. You'll see it as it happens later on in the new adventures. And we actually did know where the pub yeah, I was. Know, I know. Amazingly. First time we've ever stayed in that place for more than 30 yeah. seconds driving and through we, it. And we happened to have seen the <laughs> pub five minutes before. So I was very pleased to be able to direct him. But, Kay, when was the last time someone came up to us and did that? Yeah, it was. We were recording at the top of Sutton Bank. Yes, and what sat, were we doing? Sat in the back of the car. A road trip. We were. It's so bizarre, isn't it? You know, we were sat there with a tripod and a camera in front of us and we were talking to it. And yet he had absolutely no qualms about interrupting us. He won't have noticed it. He probably wouldn't have. He was on a bike. So He'll he have seen two have. people sat on a lovely bench yeah. under a beautiful oak tree yeah. in a gorgeous yeah. village and thought... They look helpful. Yes, they do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think... They look like they know where they are. <laughs> so later on in the show... You will be joining us. Now, in the process of us going on that new adventure, I learnt something new. Mm. Because I had no idea what a popo was. <laughs> in fact, I'm still not sure. I can't believe you're talking about this. OK, so we were at Midlam and, you know, doing some filming. And Midlam is a huge centre for racehorse training. Yeah. Gosh, and aren't racehorses beautiful? Uh, you know, you don't often see a racehorse really close up, do you? But when we were in Middleham, a whole group of them come, you know, trotting down the main street. Yeah, yeah. And they were obviously off to the runs, wherever, yeah. the, wherever the runs were. Yeah. And I said to... I it's just when we turned, were up on the hill. We were up on oh, the hill. Were we, were we up on the hill? We were up on the hill and we heard horses. Oh, right. And okay. you said... I said, oh, can you hear those lovely popos? <laughs> and I said, what's a popo? I said it's a horse. Right. I said I always used to call horses popos when I was little. Now, did you come to a conclusion as to why you called them popos? No, and I haven't. It's more likely to be a parental thing. I need to ask my mum about so it. I, I forgot if it's an to Irish ask thing. her. I should have asked her. I spoke to her yesterday. I should have asked her. Maybe it's an Irish thing. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's because I couldn't say ponies, so I said popos. Yeah. Yeah. But I've always known horses as popos, but in our 16 years together, I've, I can't believe I've never said it. No, never. So he had great joy in, I did in, when he picked Bryony up, telling her all about it. And of course, Bryony was like, what? 
No but, idea what you're talking about. So if there's anybody out there that's heard that that term for a horse, then let you know. Let me know. I'm not absolutely crazy. I, of course, it could be something I just personally made up. It's either or something my mum made up. It's that's either, very likely. It's likely it could be an Irish colloquialism. It could be, couldn't it? Which would be wonderful. Yeah. Or it is just a word that you've come up, which then would be cute. Yeah. So, and you know, I say from now on, they're popos. Feel free to use my popos yes, yes. instead of horses. <laughs> but look, not only do we have a new adventure last Friday, the Miss Potter 2. Oh, yes. Miss Christmas 2. Oh, I love Miss that. Miss Christmas. No, no, no. It, it just made me think of John Lithgow in The Santa Claus, where he decides to have Christmas 2 in March. Oh, yeah, he yeah. does, doesn't he? But no, no, it's the Miss Potter too. Yes. What a gorgeous first pattern. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. I'll be showing it in what? What's Off Your Needles. I will show you the Mrs. Tiggy, because the first pattern was inspired by, of course, lovely Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. I've been dying to, you know, do a pattern based on Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, and I knew that it was going to be in this collection, and I just thought, oh, it's got to be the first pattern that goes out. Yeah. And I'm super pleased with it. It's really, really pretty and lovely to knit. So I'll be showing you that in a little bit. Honestly, I am really, really happy just because we have... Because, you know, last episode, I think we did sort of bemoan summer a little. Did we? I can't imagine we would do I that. I think we did. I know we don't... Look, you know we don't like summer. And look, it was really within, like, 72 hours of that show going yeah. out. Something changed. It changed really quickly. <laughs> and I... I I think actually it's marvellous what had happened was it was just gradually changing but then we had that crazy hot yeah. spell for a few days yeah. and that kind of interrupted so when that went away it then just picked up if you like where yeah. it, it was but it just felt like such a, a so distinct change for it to just suddenly become like autumn in yeah, like, it, it, it felt like overnight. It was lovely when we were out recording that day. I was, it was. Because it was cool and, you know, a little bit breezy and just lovely for just wearing a little jacket and a cowl. Yeah. Because we went, when we got in the cars, just as we were about to leave, Dan says, are you going to be warm enough? And I'm like, warm enough? You know, because we've been so boiling. He said, oh, I would take a cowl if I were you. So I did and I, I did goodness. wear it. So you did, it was you did. Lovely. It really was, yeah. you know. So we are slap bang now in the season which we... Or just at the beginning. It's, yeah, it's not quite autumn not yet. And at I will talk... Yes, I've got something very exciting to Ooh, talk about. Fun. In Endy Bits. Yes. So yes. stick around for Endy Bits because we've got a new knit-along starting very soon and it's very much connected to the beginning of autumn. Cool. Look, it's time for us to find out because I'm blown away by the... I hope you're showing that first. I am. Thank goodness. Kay Jones, what's on your needles? It's so colourful. Oh, it is so colourful, yes. Right, so this little project was inspired by Bryony's love. And I also really like this, this programme, her love of the programme Glee. Now, we'd never watched Glee. I know it's a good few years old now, isn't it? But we'd never watched it. I'd never really heard of it. But I came across it, gosh, probably, you know, the best part of a year ago and started watching it and I thought... I think Bryony's going to love this. So I stopped watching it and I let her watch the first couple of episodes and she was absolutely hooked. She just loves it. And we're actually now on the final series and we've got about three episodes to go. So she's a bit devastated. She started re-watching it all from the beginning, yeah. didn't she? But yeah, she, she just really loves it. And it's a great, it's a, it's a really fun programme to watch. We watch it together and it's, it's just really fun. You know, some of the songs are a bit dodgy, aren't they? But a lot of them are really fun. And there's been some brilliant guest appearances by yeah. people. Olivia Newton-John. Olivia Newton-John. And, you know, Rachel's dad, one of Rachel's dads was... Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. I mean, he hasn't been in it actually since then, which is a real shame. He was absolutely brilliant. So there's been some great sort of guest appearances. Ricky Martin was on it. That was excellent. Was but also, a, Gloria Estefan. Uh, Gloria Estefan is... Whose mum is she? She's I someone's mum, isn't she? I just love Gloria Estefan. And, Santana's mum. And also, Stifler's mum from American oh, Pie. Oh, yeah, she's... Isn't it? And, she's and she was, of course, hilarious. in Friends. She was the one who put on the fake English accent in Friends. That's right. And, and danced for Chandler. Yeah, yeah. It's really... Yeah, so she's a brilliant actor. And... 
yeah, it's just been really fun to watch. So we're nearly at the end of it. But she said to me recently, she said, oh, her, fav her favourite characters in the programme, from the beginning, since she saw them, and I knew that this particular person would be her favourite. Her favourite characters are Kurt and Blaine, or Clayne, as she calls them. Or Blurt, as or I call Blurt. them. Or Blurt, you call them Blurt. <laughs> yeah, and that really annoys Brian. She's like, no, they're not. She's very defensive of her favourite characters. So she asked me if I would knit something rainbow, you know, in, in honour of Kurt and Blaine. So I thought, yeah, absolutely, I will do that. And I went through my stash to try and find, you know, six minis that would work as a rainbow and I just didn't have quite the right colours so I thought well do you know what I can just dye them I've got some minis in my stash so I will just dye them up so I did that and I will show you the colours that I came up with she wanted a nice bright rainbow oh I'm knitting with that one it's attached in fact I've got a set that I can just show you in the minis because here they are oh aren't they lovely I went for a pinky red, I didn't want a red red, I wanted a pinky red. And then this is kind of like a peachy orange and a golden yellow. And I did, the way I dyed these, I, I did like a base colour. So for example, the orange, because I wanted a peachy orange, I actually dyed this initially with a peach colour and then I over dyed it with, I think it was citrus was the colour, a really bright orange, but I just went gentle with it until I got the right shade that I wanted. And the same thing with the blue, I started this with a sky blue, and then I over dyed it with a brilliant blue. So the, you get a really nice tone, you can see the kind of lighter colours underneath it, and it just produces a really nice depth to the colour rather than it being sort of a flat colour. So I've got, I dyed up an extra set as you can see and I'm going to use these as a prize in something we're going to talk about in Endy Bits. But they're, they're all the colours that I used, really, really pretty. I wound mine into little balls and I'm knitting her some fingerless mitts because she loves fingerless mitts. She's got, I think, two pairs that she wears a lot for school and she likes fingerless because she, she needs access to getting her bag off and getting books out and things like that. So I thought, right, okay, I'll knit some fingerless mitts for her. So I'm just improvising a pattern. I wanted to put some kind of textured pattern on the front. I didn't want it to just be plain. I wanted something going on. And I've really wanted to do something else with the, the stitch pattern from my Jemima socks. So I used that, but I just tweaked it slightly so that I got really clean lines in between the colours. So this is the mitt so far. Oh, isn't it fun? Oh, it's so fun. And I'm actually on the ribbon at the top here. You can see what I was really pleased because I managed to get through all of the colours and then go back to the pinky red at the top. So it's, it's top and bottom with the same colour and then, you know, going through the rainbow. And that's it, you know, just in the plain colours. And I like the tone that you get. It's not, they're not really flat colours. It's really pretty. So this is my Jemima pattern, but just slightly tweaked. And it gives these really clean transitions between each colour. And I think that's really nice. They're great. And I, I just kind of made up a thumb gusset. I mean, I wasn't using a, a pattern as such. I cast on 56 stitches and I'm using two and a half millimetre. And that seems to give a really nice size. I'll pop this on my hand. So I just improvise the gusset increases. I do prefer a thumb gusset on mittens and gloves and things. Just the same way I prefer gussets on socks, I think. It, it just makes more sense to me. And just what would you more... do instead of a gusset? Well, you can do, it's the same as socks, really. You can do like an afterthought thumb. All right. You can do more of like a thumb slot with some increases. There's a, there is a lot of different methods. I just really like the traditional kind of thumb gusset. Because you can see there's, it just opens yeah, yeah. out over your thumb and that's it on my hand. Aren't they just so fun? And you can see when I've knit the rib, it's going to come to about here, which will be perfect for fingerless mitts, I think. Oh, I just think they're really nice. And I'll just go back and pick up stitches for the thumb. And I was part way through the blue. I think I've got like maybe sort of four or five more rounds. 
on the thumb to reach the number of rows that are in the stripes and then I'll change to the purple for the rest of the thumb so that it follows the stripe sequence on the thumb. Mm. I think that'll just make it really neat. And they fit really nicely. In hindsight, I could have gone down a needle size, I think. I'm pretty sure, I, you know, I could have gone to 2.25 millimetres. It would have been fine. But I didn't want it to be too small. And I think if a, a mitt is just a little bit, tiny bit oversized, if you like, it's fine. It's not a problem. It's just really fun. And I've knit this so quick. I yeah, think, it seemed like only two minutes ago I you know, were dyeing the yarn. I know, I did. I was so it took me a good few days to find the time to dye the yarn, but once I'd got it, I just cast it on, and it's just so quick because you just want to get to the next colour and the next colour. Yeah, and it's just so lovely. And I've barely used any of the twenty gram mini at the moment. You got enough to make two, maybe. I'll weigh it all when I've made the pair so that I know exactly how much yarn it took. But it's, I think it's a brilliant use of just little leftovers as well to make yourself a little pair of fingerless mitts. And I really like fingerless mitts as well. I do wear them a lot because, you know, when I'm out for my walk every day, if I sometimes need to access my phone, you know, to if that particular book might have run out or for whatever reason then it's really good just to have your fingers kind of accessible, isn't it? Yeah. But you could easily make it into a full mitten just by knitting a bit more and doing some decreases. But I, I just really like the simplicity of a fingerless mitt. For me, it's kind of like knitting a sock, but a bit easier, isn't it? I don't know. You'd really like knitting fingerless mitts, I think. I wasn't sure what increase to use. That You've got lots of options. Some patterns just have like a left-leaning increase because that's the easiest of the two to work, isn't it? I always find a left-leaning is easier than the right. You know, so sometimes it'll just have a left-leaning on both sides. Sometimes it'll have one leaning right, one leaning left. That's quite common. But actually what I did was I just did knit front backs because I just wanted the simplicity and I think it looks perfectly neat and tidy. And it's just dead easy. Knit front backs are so easy, aren't they? Yeah. And you don't need to think, oh. I've only done them once. Oh, really? Yeah, when I made the Susan Claudino. Oh, right. The, the oh, when I the see whale. that now, yeah. It's I like in, that whale. It's in Brownie's room. I can't, what was that called, that way? It's a great pattern. Yeah, we'll link it in the show. it's lovely. But I, it's just easy and you don't need to think, oh, is it a right or is it a left when you get to that point? I'm just doing knit front back, knit front back, and it's really easy. So that worked out great. And the only thing that I always find a bit of a thing is, is just closing up that gap mm. when you put the thumb stitches back on. And because of the way that I did the increases, I did have to, a backwards looped cast on some stitches, just a couple of stitches, you know, to replace the ones that have been incorporated into the thumb. But that means that you're left with like a little area there yeah. where you've got to pick up some stitches. But I just like the simplicity of that. So what I will do when I pick up the stitches is I always kind of pick up too many and then on the first round for the thumb, I'll just decrease a few away. And that, again, just sort of brings it in. And at the end of the day, if you do end up with still a little bit of a hole, you've got yarn ends in there from when you've knit the thumb, so you can just sew it up and it's not a bother. But I do like things neat, so I will try and get that as neat as possible. So I really like these. I think they're fun and it's just been a quick, lovely thing to knit. Yeah. And it would be a great little gift knits as well you know you could go into your stash and pick out if you know you've got a friend who liked blues for example you could just go into your stash and pick out loads of leftovers that were all different shades of blue and knit one up I think that would be lovely so yeah that's Brian's little rainbow mitts lovely. and I'm sure they'll be done for next time because they're super quick Dan James yes what's on your needles it's very colorful too it is it's kind of rainbow it's as great well, isn't it? this Look, we kind of match, don't we? It way? really is lovely yarn. Yeah. I mean, I love the way it's striping there at the top yeah, and then the thicker yeah. ones and then the thinner ones. And it's just great. Yeah, I think this, this might be my favourite opal that I've knit with. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. Because it just is super interesting. And, you know, combine that with a, a pattern that's got a bit of something going on because, you know, I don't like plain socks. No. And, you know, everything's great. And... 
The only thing that hasn't gone quite so great on this sock is I seem to struggle to count to three. No, honestly, what's it like? Oh, I don't know. So you've, sometimes you've got more rows in between the little Peter stitch. Yeah, or less. Or less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, thankfully, it looks fine. It looks fine. I think because it is a, a sort of textured pattern yeah that you know making those mistakes and that's a good thing to know i think isn't it it's you know lovely. if you're knitting a pattern and you know it's forgiving then certainly from where i'm sat <laughs> that makes me Gosh, like you guess it has worked really well hasn't it now that's the with the colors look oh yeah yeah the, 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 the color it's like look it's like opposite you know what i mean it's but sometimes if you don't use a contrast heel, you can get just like one little thin line of colour. Well, I, what I did was I pulled out some extra. You and did I... not. Don't believe it. Was, a word it was all of planned. It. It was you all did planned. not. Your heel's still a bit baggy. It's not as bad but as the other really, one. They're really nice. I love the colours on the heel, actually. It looks really pretty, doesn't it? Yeah, I've just got to pull even. T I was really pulling as well. Which bit was, was is bad? It's not bad. These stitches here on your heel turn... Yeah, they can't see. Are, they all want to see. The stitches on his heel turn are looser. So do you mean these stitches or yeah. those stitches? These stitches? Yes. Okay. Because the gauge... So it's when on, you're working backwards and forwards. Your gauge on your heel... Yeah. You can see these are tighter here. Yeah. And your heel stitches are looser. Yeah. So it's you're just losing tension a bit when you're knitting the heel. Your actual connecting stitches as well, like the decreased stitches either side could do with it being a bit tighter. The whole heel turn just needs to be a bit tighter. Right. Well, I'll rip it out. You will not rip it out. What's it like? No, I won't rip it out. Look, talk about the good bit. Oh, his pickup is excellent. You know, to close the gap. Let me get that yarn out of the way. The pickup is really good. Can you see in the corners here? Really neat. They're thinking the other side's got a big hole in because one side's always no, worse. No, I mean than it the hasn't. Other. One side is always worse than the other, but it hasn't got a hole though. Aha! See? I proved you wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Should I tell you what See? I did? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I've done, right? I've watched Kay's two stitch pickup tutorial loads. Whenever I've come to do the pickup, I watch it and then I go do it. And then, this was the key stage for me, I made some bullet point notes. Not very long at all. It's only really sort of, it's only really the point where you're picking up and where you're mm -hmm. going into. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So I made that and I made that actually, you know, I did, I made it in my phone because my phone does tend to be with me quite a lot. I never do that, I never make notes in my phone. Well, the reason why I did it was I have sort of key notes in my phone just in case I'm out in the car or, you know, right. I'm somewhere and I'm knitting and I don't have my pad. I do use that pad, mm, you know, I use you it do, every day. So yeah, that's Dan's sock, back to the sock, and it's this yarn. It's the Opal Symphony of Dreams, that means. And this colour is 9617, the translation of which is Beautiful Meadow. And it's just these gorgeous, it's kind of rainbow-like, isn't it? It's lovely. It's really nice to knit with and, you know, I, I strongly recommend it. Yeah, I think it's great. it's really nice. I've actually changed the bag. Oh, have you? Yeah. Why? What was wrong with the bag? I lost a needle. Oh, uh, it kept coming out of the gap, didn't it? Yeah, do you know where it is? No. Oh. What ones are they? Where did you find the other one? What other one? Oh, you need another needle? No, no. I got one from my collection. Oh, right, okay. You've got a collection? Yeah, I have a collection of needles. I'm a knitter, okay? Knitters yeah, need notions. I thought you just used the ones that are in, like, all of these. No, I have my own needles now. Oh, right, okay. Yes. No, I haven't seen the needle. It's a chow goo, 2.75 millimetre you used. Yes. I haven't seen it, no. It's likely, but you do throw your project bags around. And the other one was a drawstring, that's what I mean, and it slipped out of the little... I'm loving knitting the, the, the sock. It's a great pattern. It's the Peter pattern. Yes. From the previous Miss Potter sock yes. club. Yes, that's a lot of peas. It is, isn't it? What else is on your needles? Oh, gosh. Right. That's some more peas. It is. Yes. It's my penguino. Now, Dan made me put this away. Did, I did. He, he did. Because... She's a fool, I tell you. I'm not... I don't know why I'm a fool. Because you don't knit what you want to knit. Oh, gosh. I've been kind of forcing myself to knit this. Because... You've always done this, though. 
I know. You've always picked things that you think, oh. No, that's not true because when I started knitting the penguino, I was really enjoying it. Right, okay. And the point where I've started to not enjoy it is just because it's so now huge. The thing that has really done me in, I'll be honest, and I am going to finish this, because Dan said to me, are you actually going to finish that? You should just not finish it kind of thing. I didn't say, are you actually no, going to finish that? No, but I you said, said to me... Just stop knitting it. You did say stop knitting it. Yeah. And I'm sure you said to me, are you actually going to finish it? And I said, yeah, I am going to finish it. Why would I say that? Because my point was to get you to stop knitting it. I wouldn't guilt you into well, finishing knitting it. No, if it. I stop knitting it, that means I'm not going to finish it. Yeah, and that was where I was going with this. I know that's what I've just said. That you were said you were what you were saying to me was don't finish it. Yes. Yeah. But you said, are you going to finish it? And that to me sounds like me guilt. Are you actually going to finish that? Do you know what I mean? Well, are you going to finish it or what? Oh no, it wasn't that kind of. No. It was like, are you really going to finish it? You were like saying you don't want to knit it. Are you really going to finish it? It was that kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's exactly right. Interpretation. Yes. No, I wasn't trying to guilt her into finishing it. I was trying to get her to stop knitting it because right. I knew how unhappy it was making her. Because oh, what gosh. is the point? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. But I will tell you what I'm finding. I'm just finding it unpleasant. <laughs> It's the sleeves. This is, you can see, look, I'm working on the first one here. And I'm not a million miles away from finishing this now. But the problem, the problem I'm having is I'm just not enjoying the way that you've got to knit these sleeves. It's primarily knit flat. You can see I'm knitting the sleeves flat. However, it's almost in the round. If you look at it, do you see what I mean? You're, you, you're almost in the round, aren't you? And what you do is you're knitting flat and then you're picking up and knitting stitches either side to to attach it to the bottom here. And then when you've done that, which I have done, you then start doing decreases here until you get to a point where you've done enough of those and then you stop and he, ha he then has you doing something with this gap here, I forget what now. And then ultimately you then do switch to knitting in the round just for the little bit of cuff at the bottom. But it's, I'm finding it so uncomfortable to knit. You know, you've, for starters, you've got all of this going on on your knee and then you're knitting flat on a piece that seems almost in the round. So it's very awkward to knit. If you imagine, you know, here is the beginning and you know, I'm having to knit across like that. When you get to sort of this point here, you're all, you know, this bit's attached and it sort of pulls in and I'm just, you know, and the whole time I'm knitting it, I'm thinking, gosh, I've got to do the other sleeve. I was determined when I was knitting this, I was like, right, okay, do you know what? I'm just gonna only knit on this until I've finished both of those sleeves. And I got to this and point- And make myself miserable. I was completely miserable. And I got to this point, so, you know, I've knit all of this since the last, I think I'd just picked up, had an eye for the sleeve the last time. So I've knit all of this and it's moss stitch. So that takes a lot longer. It's knit one pearl one, you know, so it takes a lot longer to knit than if it was just garter. But I really love the look of the moss stitch. I've actually just changed yarn colors because I thought that might inspire me a bit more if I changed color. I did, I was going to keep it all in this lilac. I've just changed to this speckled. But Dan made me put it down and it was the absolutely right thing to do. I was so much happier. I was like, oh yeah, I'll put it away. I'll put it in the bag. I can't see it. I'm not going to think about it. So, oh, I just don't know. I mean... The only time that you should so knit this on that... Is, so this is like the front you can see here and here's the sleeve coming down. But I think because it's such a massively oversized garment as well, that makes it even more weighty. Yeah, okay, I appreciate the advantages of having it all in one piece. But when you've got this many ends to deal with at the end, can you see them? When you've got this many ends to deal with when you've finished the garment, I might as well have knit it in pieces and been much happier. Yeah, let's just look at some of the positives because I've not really done that yet. Right. That looks stunning. Yeah, it I looks, mean, the moss stitch is lovely. It looks lovely. stunning in it's, that yarn. Yeah, I've just used a, this is Cascade Heritage in lilac, I think. Yeah. Held double with the DK yarn, which is what I'm doing. 
which is the King Cole Merino DK and the colourways Aran. So I'm just I'm holding that one all the way through and then just changing the fingering weight min, sort of like leftovers and minis if you like. And I do really like that lilac, I think it's really pretty and really nice. But I, so I just don't know. I can see you in it. Yeah, I mean I can see me wearing it. But at the moment, you know, I've got to finish this sleeve. Yeah. I've got to then go across and do exactly the same thing for the other sleeve, which fills me with dread. You should not knit on that until you think, oh, do you know what? I really fancy knitting on my Pengrono. I don't know if I'm ever going to be at that stage, though. So in three months, you hibernate it forever but then and put I it just, down to experience. But then I feel like I've wasted all that time. Why? I just you do. enjoy knitting. I know. But I, I really, I do want the finished thing, you know, I mean, I well, really love... Well, that then should be your inspiration. I love the way the, you know, the welts look on the back. I think that's really nice. I do want the finished thing. But there you is know, no it's point just the thought putting yourself of... through... Because knitting, I think, has a... There's a lot of skills in life which, if you do them and they make you unhappy, it has a roll-off in the rest of your life. For example... Yeah. If I was playing a show with dreadful music, it would make me unhappy for the whole time I was playing that show. I know. Because it's like you're doing... I used to say it would be like being a Formula One driver in a Formula One car and driving at 30 everywhere. Yeah, you I know what you mean. You just get frustrated. I know what you mean. But this is the thing with me and garment knitting. And I, I really want the finished things. But I just don't want to knit them. And you know, what does that mean? I don't Shall know I what, what that says about me, really. I'll tell you what that means. That means I need to knit the things that you want. Yeah, in and form. you know, I'm wearing my solia today. And I'm telling you. Which is well, fantastic. The colours. You know? And just. Yeah, I mean, it's. All really hail nice. to K because you picked these colours yeah. and they suit you. I don't think you've got any... I've never seen you wear anything that makes you... No. Do you know what? I always thought I was a person who suited more pastel shades. You know, uh, pinks and light blues and peaches and things like that. But actually, I don't think I am. I think I do suit more autumnal colours. Th this colour is great. Yeah. But also, all of these colours work together then with... You know, yeah, just... I mean it's lovely. So I love I love having the finished thing, and I want the finished thing. I I just never would have knit this, and I don't know what that says about me as a knitter. It says you're not a garment knitter. Yeah, I There's know, no but then to... I just don't feel like I'm a real knitter because that's, I don't want to knit. That's external pressure it's, that you're getting from social media. It probably is, because everywhere no you look... No one's putting it on you. No, no, you're no. You're putting it on yourself. Absolutely And I'm no, sure that you will, will no probably is, at times do that too. No, no one is pressuring me into doing no, anything, you no. know. It's pressure that I'm putting on myself. But I do think it is because I see... Because garment knitting is very big, isn't it, right now? And it's been big for a while, you know. Colourwork sweaters are beautiful. And I people do wonder, are though. churning out sweater after gorgeous sweater. And I just think, oh my goodness, you know, I should be doing that because everyone my, my, else is doing that. And I wonder that, how many other people think that and, well, and I, don't want to I do hope, that. I hope I'm not the only one because you're not I the do only sometimes one. think, I think I'm the only one that doesn't oh, really insane. want to knit garments. I want to have, it's like the Hit a Food Day that I cast on. I haven't touched it since. I just don't really want to knit it. So, gone. I, I would love the finished gone. thing. I want, you know, I would love a beautiful. That fingering, fingering way, here's a food day, I would love it. But just the thought of knitting it doesn't fill me with joy. And you're right, Look, and I give, shouldn't... Give me two years and I'll be doing fingering way jumpers. Yeah, and I just have this internal battle with myself, thinking I should be knitting all these beautiful garments. And I'll, I'll come back to... I'll come back to the, the music analogy is an easy one for me, because you know, I'm, I'm a musician. If you are a musician and you are playing the music which you don't enjoy, you're wasting your time. Yeah. Similarly, if you are a knitter and you just think that your needles are an instrument yeah and you yeah. like playing certain tunes mm. you don't like playing garment tunes so don't play no them. but i do really want to finish this because I, I just do i want to finish it it's like i've you know it's a, it's a challenge now it's a real challenge for me to finish this and i just want to achieve it and i think i'll feel really good that's cool but i do it. not think you should dive into it no full on. i think maybe what i need to do is just do a little bit each time and those little bits will build up won't they i do think though that a rest 
Yes, you know, absolutely. Arrest. A change is good as a rest, isn't it? Yeah, you know? I, I tend to think, right, OK, if I've got something that I don't really want in it, I'll just throw myself into it and just do it and do it and do it until it's finished. But then the danger with that is that at the end of that, you're so exhausted from knitting it that you don't want to knit anything. And I never want to get in that position. I very rarely feel like that. I seriously think stepping away from something means when you step back into it, it doesn't feel quite so monotonous yeah, and boring. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think right now, that's why I said put it down before, I think you need to just be away from it for, you know, two, three, four weeks. Yeah, you're probably right. And then, yeah, I mean, and I'll... Or maybe, maybe you know, maybe focus on, you know, the run into Christmas and pick it up in January or something. Well, I, I'll just, I guess I'm, what I shouldn't do is just say, right, you know, I'll pick it up in X number of days or whatever. I'll just, like you say, do it when... But the thing is, there's something always more appealing. I've got... Good. Knit those things. I know. I'm like, oh, I'd much rather work on that blanket or that pair of so socks. So you've got to do that because you were saying to me, you or... have to do those things because you were in a place just, you know, a week ago where you were like, you weren't even saying that. You were saying, oh, I'm just not into anything, you know, and it's all it does, it really does, challenging. Yeah, and it's because of this. It is because of this. And, and then I think to myself, you know, why do I even start these things? Because I should know by now yes. that although, yes, you know, that project seems brilliant and I really wanted to make it, I should know myself well enough to know that when I get to a certain point, I'm not going to want to knit it. And then I could have been much more productive working on things that I wanted to knit. So yeah. I think, you know, the lesson learned is that I've really got to resist that pressure that I put on myself. All you have to, to do... To think that I'm an only a knitter if I knit garments. All you have to do is knit the things you want to knit. I know. Don't and knit that's the things really, you feel like really you should hard. knit. That's really hard for me because, you know, and it probably is, you know, all, all these things that I see on social media and all these beautiful patterns that come out on Ravelry all the time you know and you just see people and I've seen I've seen loads of people knit the penguino and I've I haven't heard really anybody say anything not negative you know I'm not being negative about it all I'm saying is that it's not suiting me I'm sure I, I'm thinking again I'm thinking am I the only one that found these sleeves so tedious to knit Am I the only one? Because I've not heard anybody else say this. And I've seen, like I say, I've seen people knit it. So that then makes me think, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me who... The long story short, it wasn't a long story short. It was a long story long. But, yeah, I'm putting that away for a little bit until I'm in a position where I think, OK, do you know what? I'm ready to, to try and crack on with that. Yeah. And the lesson learned is a simple one. Play the tunes you were born to play. Yeah. Don't play the tunes someone else tells you to play. Yes. What else is on your needles? You don't normally say that. I don't, do I? How interesting. Wasn't that fun? Yes. It's a first. So I was knitting this the other night, and Kay was like, ooh. I went, oh my goodness. Well, look, when did you knit that? You, you always want the things that I'm showing, so you take it. Look In fact, this. it's a decree. From now on, you just take the things and show them, <laughs> and I'll just talk about look it. Look at talking of garments, you see? But this is where we're perfect. Yes. Because Dan really enjoys knitting garments, so why do I pressure myself? But again, I'm putting this pressure on myself. No one is doing it to me. No, no, no. I know it's totally me. It's all but a, a mental battle. You know, that is life, unfortunately. I know. You know, and, and different people have different challenges along the way. Yeah, you and seem to have different. a massive internal battle with inadequacies. I do. I absolutely do. And everybody's different, aren't they? And it's like you say, it's just my battle, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but anyway. And through the colour work. Look at, look at Dan's. Oh, my goodness. It's odd, this, because I think... Isn't it beautiful? All the other <gasps> things that I've knit, the... Did I say that right? All the other things that you've knit? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I wanted to make sure I said it right. Knitted, maybe. All the Kn other things that I've knitted. Excellent. Yeah. All the other things that I've knitted, not all the, all the other things, all the other garments that I've knitted have gone through the body and then the sleeves. And with this, because it was the sleeves first, mm. and because the sleeves aren't in this bag, because if they were, there just wouldn't be enough space for everything, <laughs> you sort of look at this and you think, it's September, and I've knit about six inches. And you just start thinking, this is not going well. But then I have to remind myself, I've knit two sleeves knit already. Two sleeves. And, you know, so just relax a bit. Yeah. And 
But it's so beautiful, isn't it? This is the... The work that I've done... Like what? Yes. The work that I've done around colour work, it's so, so important that I did it. Because if I hadn't done it, I think, you know, well, this just wouldn't look as nice as it looks. Mm. And that's where the steak's going to be. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, I'm not... I'm not frustrated yet. Exactly. Granted, I've only done like five rows of plain missing, <laughs> but I'm about to put in markers and do the ribbing for the pockets, so which will be exciting, cool. Yeah. So that'll be fun for a few rows. Then it is going to be sort of challenging, but thankfully you're not massively tall. So <laughs> I'm average. Well, yeah, but you know... I'm five six. Th thankfully, I think that's average. you know, I'm not going to have... A huge body to knit. No, but I do like a long body. I know I you do. I've got a long Look, body. I'm, this is a mental battle. Oh, I've helped sorry. you with yours. Now help me with mine. I, I mean, I, this, this is a cardigan. Obviously, it's going to be steaked. And, you know, it doesn't have to be super long, actually, thinking about no, no, it. It needs to be right. I don't want to mess around. It needs to be right. Yeah. Yes. So, through the body. And then, what I'm really looking forward to, and I'm, I'm feeling slightly pressured about this, because I've worked so hard on it, and I'm going to need to knit another one of those hats, just to remind myself of that seat technique that I developed mm. for doing the lovely colour work that's mm. at the top of the clay mm. it's beautiful but it has a tendency for the the non-dominant colour to disappear mm. because it's one mm. by one but the technique I worked up if you recall from earlier this year and you know if you've been watching Return to the Centre of the Earth you'll have seen this in detail the technique that I you know, worked up for that colour work on the top it works mm. but you know I do it's think really that lovely. right before probably halfway through the body when I've got you know halfway to go on on the plain knitting that's mm. when I should do another one of those hats right and it can be a Christmas gift right I love the colours I think the colours are just lovely you know. well done you did I choose them of course you did oh right oh I could not choose colours I wouldn't even try and choose colours I think it's lovely I would just it's just it's not very, my thing you see this feels like very me with the yeah yeah, it's lovely. I can't remember what size you're knitting, I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember. No, I, mean, I think we went up a size from normal just because, just in you case. You wanted an oversized cardigan. I wanted it more uh, slightly oversized, yeah. Well done. So thoroughly enjoying it. It's really good fun. What yarn is it? It is. It, is it the same as the Solia that I'm wearing? No, I think it's slightly different. Or maybe it is. No, I don't think it is. Well, it's Drops it's, Charisma. It's Drops Charisma. This is yeah. Drops Charisma. Right. So, yeah, it is the same yarn. Hey. So we know, we know that it washes and wears really nicely. So, yeah, it drops charisma. Now, I must tell you that <laughs> I can hand wind yarn. Although you don't like the way I hand wind yarn, but I can hand wind yarn absolutely perfectly, and I enjoy doing it. And I love the, the wet splicing, and I love all of that. I just, I think it's just, it's great, it's great fun. But last night, Kay was so tired, she couldn't knit, but she wanted something to do. I was so tired because I didn't want to fall asleep the second I got in bed. Cause... So it was marvellous. I got a three skate. <laughs> he said, here, wind these. And she wound them for me. Dangerous and then she finished doing that. And I thought, oh, I need to keep her awake for just a few more minutes. So she sleeps <laughs> till a decent time. So she spit spliced my yarn for me. I did. It was marvellous. Yeah. You weren't happy about it. But you did it. I didn't want that. I was like, oh, she was too tired. She was going. You see, she was going to drop off. I was so but, tired anyways, last so night. Perfect. So I didn't have to do anything, and you did it all. I it did. But not only that, I'm ready for the next ball. I know. But not only that, I did another one as well for, for you for my cascades. For your cascades. It's marvelous. I love hand winding yarn. You know, it's just, it's very. I don't know. It's just very satisfying, especially when your ball winder is a big pile of rubbish. Yes. And I really need to get a new one. But I just, I really like the look of, yeah. you know, hand-wound yarn. I just, it's very, um, I don't know, it connects you to the past kind of thing just because it, it feels more like... It reminds me of hardware stores and string from when I was growing oh, up. Oh, yeah, it does look like a ball of string. Yeah, yeah. marvellous. Yeah. So, yes, I'm thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying this and I'm really looking forward to, and but also terrified, but glad that we now have a plan about the steaking. The steaking. Yes. We've got time to research it and... We absolutely do. And, you know, what's been interesting for me has been it took me a few minutes, and I do feel silly about this now, but I got to the end of this point here and it didn't say in the pattern what I should do with this yarn. The you blue, see the, the, the colour work that's running up? And I'm not joking you when I tell you that a huge part of me thought... I had to float the yarn and carry it on around the whole of the project 
to then carry on <laughs> these all the way up, up the... And I'm thinking, I, I'm going to go crazy. If I have to float this yarn... I mean, I wonder what the longest floats are that people have, have had to do. Well, it's not all the way around a jumper. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's genius. But of course, of course, you know, it's because it was sort of later on... Because you know, I, I normally knit this probably about half past eight, nine o'clock. And, you know, you're later on and you're just... Your brain doesn't quite work really quite as sensibly as it normally would because next morning it dawned on me, well, of course those are there because if those weren't there, you'd have one massive float that you would then be cutting when you steeped it and you'd mm. have a serious problem. So that's the reason why those two bits of colour But you wouldn't there. know that, would you? You wouldn't... No. You know, it's not a knowledge you would no. automatically have. Only logic would lead you to that answer, yeah. which it and, did. I mean, you are cutting the floats effectively that belong to those two blue stitches but then that will get folded back, won't it? And, and sewn down. It, yeah, you will have. Well, you will. I will have already sewn. Yeah. Along there. I mean, I'll have to, I don't know where I'm going to be sewing along, but anyway. Yeah. We will. We will tackle that when we get to it. So that is my clay quart, and you can follow the progress of that. I've got a new episode actually of Return to the Centre of the Earth coming at the end of this month. Don't miss it. Now, folks, it's time for a new adventure, and oh, we are yay. blessed. We are blessed. Have you got your popcorn? With living 15 minutes from the Yorkshire Dales. And it, we thought it was time that we got to the bottom of which of the Dales is our favourite. Hmm. So join us as we take you on a little trip down the rather gorgeous Dale of Wensleydale. That sounds funny. It does sound funny. Let's watch funny. and find out. <laughs> brand new season of new adventures. Over the next eight episodes, we've lined up some of the most exciting stories and destinations that we've ever uncovered. In past seasons, we focused on the stories of kings, queens, and lords of the manor. But this year, we're gonna shift the focus to discover the story of people like you and me. Because for every fort, stately home, and castle, there were hundreds of houses that surrounded them. And over the last 2,000 years, those houses became the towns and villages that make up England. So join us in 2019 as we uncover the most important pieces of history we've ever investigated. This is the story of England, and these are the new adventures of the Bakery Bears. million years ago, if you'd been walking here with me, we would have been at the bottom of a great sea. As the tides pushed and pulled, limestone, sandstone, and all sorts of wonderful things were laid down in the ground, perfect for the formation of valleys. As the millennia passed and the continent shifted, the land which once lay at the bottom of the ocean pushed its way out above sea level and became this beautiful landscape. These are the world famous Yorkshire Dales, home to picturesque villages, bustling market towns, thousands of sheep and lots of delicious cheese. 
So we've come to Wensleydale, probably the most famous of all the Yorkshire Dales, to uncover its story. We're going to have to cover some miles, so this is most certainly a road trip. Along the way, we'll visit churches with hidden stories. Ancient market squares with fascinating secrets. And we'll see some of the best sights that Yorkshire has to offer. But the question I'm asking, because I have absolutely no idea, is where does the story of Wensleydale begin? It's actually right here. The year was 70 AD, and the Romans were making their way up their new province of Britannia, conquering as they went. Along the way, they were laying roads and building forts, but when they arrived here, they decided to build a tower on the top of that mount. It was actually the 9th Legion and the, the Roman commander, Agricola, who was here and built that tower. The River Ewell lays close by and it had a medieval crossing point used by the local Celtic tribe, the Brigantes, and it was standard Roman practice to patrol and control these areas. For the next 1,000 years, the history books say nothing of this part of the world until the arrival of William the Conqueror and his invading Norman army. Now, the Normans were a resourceful bunch. So it will come as no surprise at all to you that they built a castle right there, most probably slap bang on top of that first Roman guard tower. And where castles are, settlements very quickly follow, as we've already discovered on this season of New Adventures. Now, something about the geography clearly worked for those first settlers here at Midlam, because very quickly, a second castle was built, and this really was the catalyst for all of Wensleydale. I'm very delighted to welcome you to Midlam Castle. The first castle built up on the mount was done so on the instruction of Alan the Red, a man we've already met in episode three of this series of new adventures. Alan must have been a generous man because very quickly Midland was gifted to his brother Rybald. Over the next 200 years, Rybald and his descendants set about building this new castle, and it really is as grand as medieval castles got. To give you an idea how highly thought of Midland was, it was often referred to as the Windsor Castle of the North. I think it's quite poetic then that by 1471 it was in the hands of the English King Richard III. Fortunately for him, he happened to fall in love with a lady who owned it, his soon-to-be wife, Anne Neville. Midland wasn't just some royal castle that the royal family visited whenever they were in the area. Oh no, this was Richard and his wife Anne's family home. And with the presence of that royal court pretty much the whole year around, it brought investment, it brought jobs, and it brought lots of people. Midland very quickly became the beating heart of the whole of Wensleydale. The town formed around two market squares, and this was the larger of the two. Every week, merchants would set up their stalls right here as people travelled from across the region to buy everything they needed. Midland was so important, though, that it actually had a separate market just for the buying and selling of pigs. And in the centre of this smaller market lies a medieval market cross. In medieval towns, the market cross was the heart of the community. Midland was so important it actually had two. From the 10th to the 16th century, every town had a market cross, but of the 12,000 which once stood, only 2,000 now remain. Why were they so important? Well, think of them as the precursor to the town hall. They were used for preaching, public announcements, and they were also the place where punishments would be sentenced and delivered. So if I was caught stealing swine from the swine market, it was right here that my punishment would be delivered. Now, before the magistrate turns up and puts me in the stocks, I think it's time that we moved on.
As we pass over Midland Bridge, which looks ancient, doesn't it, but actually it only dates from 1830, we're heading towards the place that gave Wensleydale its name. And now this is important because every other dale is named after the river which formed it. Swaledale, for example, is named after the river Swale, Coverdale, the river Cover. Wensleydale is the only one named after a place, a village, and it's called Wensley. And you would think, wouldn't you, that given that that little village has given its name to the whole of this beautiful dale, that it would be a big and important place, wouldn't you? Well, prepare to be surprised because... You couldn't be more wrong. This is the village of Wensley, and oh my goodness, it's gorgeous, but it's absolutely tiny. How did this quintessential tiny English village give its name to possibly the biggest and most famous of all the Dales? Wensley's original Old English name is Woden's Lay, or Meadow of the Viking God Odin. So it's highly likely this village was first settled by Viking raiders around 800 AD. But back then, this place was huge. The Doomsday Book, written 200 years after Wensley was formed, lists it as having well over 700 inhabitants. By 1202, it had grown even further and it was granted a market charter. Wensley quickly became the premier town in the day this was the place people like you and me would have lived and worked. And towns like this needed a church. And Wensley has arguably one of the greatest parish churches in all of England. And that's not just me saying that. Shall we go take a look? This is Holy Trinity Church, and whilst the building you're looking at dates from 1240 AD, when Wensley would have been a bustling market town, it's actually built on the site of a Saxon church, dating from 400 years before that. For 300 years, this was the most important church in the whole of Wensleydale. It served the local farming community, and I can't help but wonder how many people walked down this path through this door, attending christenings, marriages, funerals, and so much more, in what would have been the centre of the community. We're in the nave of Holy Trinity Church in Wensley, and this is the Scrope family pew. Now the Scrope family lived at Castle Bolton just up the road and they were some of the most important people in the whole of Wensleydale. But not only that, they became some of the most important people in the country because members of that family, one member in particular, became Archbishop of York, which is a vitally important position within the, the, the church within England. And this is where they came to sit for services. But not only that, at the back of it, when the monasteries were dissolved, by Henry VIII. Bits of the monasteries were moved and we're going to see little bits of those throughout today. It's the first time I've ever seen any of these things. And Easby Abbey is a place that we know well. And a screen from Easby Abbey that dates from 1500 was moved here at the dissolution. Let's go and have a little look. It's just here. So imagine you're the Scrope family. You've come for uh, morning worship on a Sunday. You walk up these steps. And rather wonderfully, they're like train carriages. It's just marvellous. Now, what I assume as well is, you draw the curtains before the, the, the service started. And then when the service starts, that's when you'd open them and you'd be interested. Because of course you'd want to shield yourself because the congregation would be staring. Because it's a little bit like the royal family. It's absolutely fascinating. And this is that screen that was moved from Easby Abbey. And there's something particularly meaningful for me looking at these things. You will know how much we enjoy exploring ruined abbeys. We're absolutely blessed with, you know, some of the most fascinating ruins, I think, in the world when it comes to abbeys. Easby Abbey is a place that we know. Easby Abbey is a place that we've visited and we've imagined what it would have been like to be a monk there. And now here, <laughs> I can sit where they would have sat. And look, 
I mean, this would have been gorgeous. Just imagine, earlier this season, we visited Ripon. And if you think about, you know, what was above the seats in the choir in Ripon, this would have been similar. Not quite as pretty, but similar. What a stunning place. And if you think this church looks familiar, if you feel like you've been here before, if you've watched the series All Creatures Great and Small and you've seen the episode The Final Furlong where James Herriot marries his wife Helen, this is the location that was used for that rather superb episode and I remember it well. It's just perfect really. It is, I'm not surprised it has been listed in the top 100 of all English churches because it is just gorgeous. But I think it's time that we found somewhere perfect for a sit and a little bit of a knit. And we spotted somewhere under a oak tree, oh yes, to do just that. Well, it doesn't get much more English than this. We're sat under a... It's an oak tree. In, Huge apart from one. the traffic, as you're hearing there. But you know, that's just the nature of the modern world, isn't it? You know, it's such a shame. It is such a shame. We were just saying, I mean, this is such a pretty little village. It's stunning. The houses um, are just amazing. They are amazing. You totally can see, you know, these, well, it, they are so, uh, there's flies everywhere too. There is Which fly, is yeah, really yeah. annoying. It is a bit annoying, so. Um, the but setting is, though is perfect. Yeah, the setting is perfect. It's just, I've never been, actually been to Wensley before. We We've may driven have driven through. through it, but it's so tiny that you wouldn't, you know, blink and you'd miss it. Yeah. yeah there's no signs to say you are now entering Wensley. We had to actually stop, didn't we? I know. And check our phones to see if we were here. I know. But it's, I mean, it, it is really lovely. And there's actually some great big pillars over there. It's like the entrance to some Thing. It, it looks, looks like, like parkland, yeah, and yeah. I can see a house right through there. It's the like a big private drive. So I'm going to look up afterwards, actually, what that is, because again, there's no signs to say what it is. No. And I suspect it's just a big house. Yeah, we go to so many places now where, and I understand why it's the case, but the churches are locked. Yeah. And you know, to be able to just walk into that it's, church. It's open, and it's it's not a church that's in regular use anymore. Just not weddings. Just, and Weddings and funerals, you said, didn't you? I'm sure they did. Um, I mean, the, the font looks in good shape. It did. So I'm sure you could go there for a baptism it if you wanted. It looked like a perfectly usable church. Yeah. It looked like one that was used. It's just because the village is now so small. It's ti it is tiny. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really surprising, isn't it, that the, the whole Dale is named after this village. And yeah, Well, that's because this place it's was just a, a huge, bustling yeah, just, market town. Yeah, and you can see how that would be because we're in kind of a little valley, aren't yeah. we? It's sort of equidistant in the middle of, of Wensleydale, this. Right. And so, you know, it made sense, really. I mean, I suppose, but it is, it's a, such an interesting one that, uh, you know, I was saying to Kay when we were travelling that it must have been such an important place when you consider that there's a lot of dales. Mm. And why was this the only one that was named, named after, after this? an actual place. Yeah. So all the other ones are based on rivers, aren't they? Like Swaledale. Yeah, yeah. It's a tricky one, this. The flies have gone away. They have, it's not too bad. Which is bad. good. But it's not, you know, with the traffic, you can hear, I'm sure. But it's, the thing is, okay, not, we could be in that church. We could have sat in the church, there was no one in there, you know, and we So you were, could go in that church, you could read. We could. You could draw. I'm sure they wouldn't, you know, if, if someone happened to come in, they're not going to move you on if you just sat there reading or knitting, are they? No. So you could absolutely do that. And actually, I didn't hear the traffic at all in the church. The pub? Straight up there. Just round that corner on the right. <laughs> we must look like we know where we are. We're doing a show here. Do you know where the pub is? I do actually, we just saw it, it's up there, it looks lovely. So, it score for knitability? Well, I'd probably go an eight, maybe. Yeah. I think you're right. 
because if you took away the traffic, yeah, it would be a ten. Yeah, I would. Because I would you agree. have this perfect seat. Yeah. It could be spitting, and, and if, we'd be dry. Even if someone was already sat here, there's like these little greens, isn't there? And you could just throw, rug out the back. Throw a blanket down, and you'd be fine. It's a bit breezy today, but you know. So this village apparently had over 700 residents, which I find amazing because now it looks like there might be about four. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, where did they all go? Let's go and find out. In 1563, the plague arrived in Wensley and it killed over half the residents of the town. I can't imagine the terror which must have haunted the congregation of this beautiful church. Within months, the majority of the residents had left. The thriving town was virtually deserted and near nearly 600 years later, all that's left is this small but absolutely gorgeous little village. So where did all those fleeing residents go to? Well, it's actually just up here. And when you come back in part two, we're gonna explore the new capital of Wensley Day. So I'll see you later in the show when we'll be exploring the rather marvelous town of Leyburn. What a journey already! And we're only halfway there. I know. I love Wensley. Oh, it was lovely. What a gorgeous place. The only thing about it was that that road was very busy. Because it's yeah. kind of like a main road, isn't it, through yeah. Wensleydale? It is. It's the main road. Real of the shame Dale. because it really you know, it cuts the village in half effectively, doesn't it? It runs yeah. through the centre of the village. Yeah. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful little place. Yes. And that church, goodness me, was just amazing. Yeah, bre bre absolutely bre breathtaking, mm. to be honest. It's one of the nicest churches I think I've, and I've was, been in. there was no one else in there when we were there as well, no. which was brilliant. No. So I think having a church to yourself, it just... There's something about it, you know. As soon as we walked in, you shut the door. You, you couldn't hear that road at all. No. It was so peaceful. You know, I could have just sat there for a good half hour just contemplating, you know, and it was lovely. It's really... And, and that's exactly really what certainly I recall when I was growing up as a Minster Choir Boy. You would regularly see parishioners coming yeah. into the Minster and they would just be sat in a just pew. Sat. Yeah, yeah. You know, they might be sat there yeah. contemplating, like you are just talking about knelt down praying they might be lighting a candle you know who knows what they might be doing and it's such a shame that in so many places now I totally understand that churches have to be locked have to be locked it's yeah, normally in the more built up yeah places this is a quiet little village where it's unlikely that they'd get any trouble really but if you think about it though actually was it last year North Allerton Church yeah I mean that was great to see you know but it, it was manned it was someone was, had to be in there. Yeah, there was somebody obviously. in there. Yeah. Whereas the, the the thing which made Wensley so wonderful yeah. was the fact that it was just unmanned. It was, it was it was just totally empty, and I think you just get it was the atmosphere, wasn't it? And you just I was just well, we, stood there we just say this thinking of all those people over all those hundreds of years that have been in there and, you know, the, the reasons that they're in there and the yes. things that goes on in their lives. Yes. And there will have been happy events, there will have been sad events. Places do retain absolutely. atmospheres and feelings. They and absolutely do. And it just had such an amazing feeling. In it that did, church. it did. And I'm telling you, one of the reasons why was because, you know, in there you've got things like that screen yeah. from Easby. Amazing to find something like that which... 
you know, monks mm. would have, you know, used every day. Mm. And that's then what adds to that feeling. Mm. Uh, but then, of course, mm. it is, it's the human element. It's the like, human element, yeah. You know, the definitely. births, the marriages, the yeah, deaths. Yeah, You see, churches see every type of life event, don't they? They do. And I think because of that... It they, makes them very special it places. It does, yeah, it yeah. does. Whether you're religious or not, you know, I think everybody can benefit from just spending time in churches like that. One of the most important things that I've learned as I've got older in life is how important reflection is yeah and it sounds a bit silly because it sounds like some sort of to me it sounds a bit zen a bit hippie-ish and or what would i want to do that no it's not at all i don't it isn't no because you know reflection allows you to put your brain in order and Mm. sets you right Mm. for the day and the, the the best place it's like you know, it's like powering down yeah, it and then is. powering Absolutely back up again. Is, when you yeah. walk into a church, you shut the door, you power down a bit. It is because it's just, I think, you know, there's so much noise in today's world, isn't yeah. there? That you very rarely are anywhere where there's not some kind of noise. No, right. You know, even if you're in your own house, you know, if you've, you know, with your family and things like that, there's always noise and. You know, we walked in there and you shut the door and you could have heard a pin drop. Yeah. It was yeah. just amazing. So, yeah. I mean, everybody should experience that, I think. And the, the more often, the better, I think. Definitely. Yeah. And folks, we're only halfway through. My goodness. Neil, if you enjoyed that, then we need you. Because New Adventures, Pudding Club, really everything that we do, well, not really, everything, everything. that we do <laughs> is empowered by our Bakery yeah. Bear patrons. So if you would like to find out about what it means to be a Bakery Bear patron and about getting access to all the exclusive, because really this, what you're watching, is just the tip of the iceberg, then if you have a read of the above... And if you follow the link below, you will find out everything there is to know about joining the Bakery Bear community. And now it's time for us to find out. Kay Jones, what's off your needles? I do have some things and it's actually all socks. Wow. Which fills me with great joy. Oh, especially those. Those fill me with particular joy. I'm so looking forward to wearing those. Now, the first thing I just wanted to show you and talk about is it's... A design I was working on from the last podcast that I spoke about that I had lots of positive comments about, and that's really kind. However, I finished the first sock and I could see there were some issues stemming from the stitch pattern. Now, there's slip stitches in the stitch pattern, so you always expect it to sort of pull in, don't you? But this was distorting in a very odd way. And I blocked it and I, I actually blocked it and then re-blocked it because it just, it wasn't, I had to really be forceful with it to get it looking kind of sock shaped. And it's the, it's the autumnal sort of sock that I was working on from last time, if you remember, using the uh, black elephant yarn, which I love. And this is the Nostalgia colorway. And it's on the, it's the, just the sock weight yarn. It's a 75-25. It's really lovely. And, you know, on the face of it, it looks okay. However, th- I've really, really blocked this. When it first came off the blockers, and it is still doing it a bit, it was curving up like this. And what the stitch pattern is causing is it's kind of pulling the toe over the top of the foot. It's pulling around like that. And I put it on my foot and it is also, it is a bit tight around here, but I could have rectified that just by going up a needle size and that would have given me a bit more ease. But it was the toe, like the actual tip of the toe was being pulled over onto the top of my foot. And I just wasn't happy, you know, I'm not comfortable putting out a design where I know that something like that is going to happen. So, I mean, like I say, I finished a sock, but the other one I just pulled off the needles, the other partial, and I've left it like this because, you know, I I could, I love this stitch pattern. I think it's really pretty and I may use it in something else. I think mitts it would work brilliantly for because it's just a straight piece of fabric, isn't it? So you can, con- you, you know, you're not turning those corners like you are with a sock, you know, and this effectively is similar to what a, 
a mitt would look like and you know it isn't distorted in any way knitting it just as a flat piece not a flat piece but you know what I mean a straight piece but knitting it as the sock it just you know I'll only put a, a design out if I'm 100% happy with it and I just wasn't 100% happy with this yeah. which is a big shame because I think it looks lovely and I love the yarn I think those speckles you can see on the bottom half here how it would just speckle in a plain <laughs> sock and I just think it's gorgeous and I've got enough yarn left over you know to, to knit a, a full pair of socks again I'm not sure what I'll do with the rest of the yarn. You know, I might knit it into just a plain pair of socks because I think it's lovely, or I might think about a different design. And, it, you know, it's a shame when that happens. It's a shame. The other thing as well that was a bit tricky about it is, again, because of the stitch pattern, when I was picking up for the corners, it made it kind of tricky to pick up because of the placement of where the slip stitches are and things. It made it difficult to see exactly where you could pick that stitch up, where normally it's really yeah, clear, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And if, I, I was thinking if I'm finding this a little bit tricky, then, you know, other people might find that tricky as well. And it did create a little hole on the other side, which never happens normally with my socks. So all of these little elements just made me think, OK, let's just chalk that up. Sometimes you've got to do that with designs, you know, and they don't always work out. And that's a difficult thing to kind of handle sometimes because you're thinking, oh, you know, I just, I just so love knitting the stitch pattern. But I can certainly, you know, putting it into a fingerless mitt, I think, would be lovely. Because yeah. it'll only be on the one side. Obviously, this is on both. Yeah. It's really cosy. I mean, if you imagine that as a fingerless mitt, it's obviously a bit big, but... I think it would be lovely. Yeah, definitely. So that could well be on the cards for it. And it would look lovely in this yarn, so... Show my socks. Maybe that's what I'll do. So that's that one. <laughs> it's like Christmas. So some I'm actual, really excited about this. <laughs> some actual finished things is I finished Dan's Boba Fett socks. I never had ribbed socks before. Yeah. Except bought socks. Bought socks tend to be ribbed sometimes. I remember having some sort of smart ribbed sort of yeah, black yeah. socks. Yeah, yeah. They do have a shop bought feel to them what i love about these is i like the fact that they're quite sucky you tried one on didn't you yeah. before i blocked them. yeah i didn't actually block them i just washed them and lay flat to dry with dan socks they're going to be perfect uh, and they fit fine and i always think they just look so ridiculous yeah they do but they fit these look particularly ridiculous because the rib is sucking it sucking it in and making it look even more sort of skinny but the yarn i think the yarn is just fantastic i mean look at the yarn it looks shop bought, doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't. I, it's like clown feet. They are like clown feet. Yeah. Let's, let's. It's because you don't have the perspective of the foot. No. It's because it's just like running straight down. On your foot, it looked great. On your foot. Let's yeah. fold it over, and then it doesn't look so big, does it? And I did my umbrella toe, and I just, the yarn is phenomenal. You know the it's way great. that it's been dyed. Yeah. She did such a great job. This is the mustache yarn. And it's in the Bobber colourway, and it's the 7525. And I've still got got two little chunks left. So I've probably got enough, actually, to make little mitts if I did the rib, you know, top and bottom rib in a different colour. I could yeah. make some little mitts, cool. so that might be fun. But they just were really, really lovely, pleasant things to knit. And they, I know. I'm not getting them yet, am No, I? they're going to be a birthday present. Okay. No, that's no, you the, can have them. No, 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 they should be a birthday present because I'm excited about them. It, the way it's been dyed, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, you know, she's done a great job. She's got speckles in there and tones and just brilliant. Yeah. So, loved, Look, loved those. This is all waffle. They don't want to see any of this. They do. They want to see. They do, don't you? You wanted to see Dan's finished socks. They're excited to see the Miss Tiggy socks. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. You see, I know, oh I made that mistake. It's your fault. When I first I blame wrote, you. When I was first designing these, I wrote Mrs. down Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Yeah, I wrote down the name. I did put Miss Tiggy. You and your cutesy words. And then, it's Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. And then I realised, no, she's Mrs. Because I looked in the, you know, read a, I went back and read her story in the book. I, I always do that, you know, if I'm designing something that's inspired by, you know, a book or a story or whatever, I'll go back and reread it. And I did that with Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. And she's so sweet, isn't she? Living, she lives in a little house, sort of cut into the hillside, and she just spends her days washing and ironing and all the clothes. For it's just, you know, they're just lovely stories, aren't they? So here are the Mrs. Tiggy socks. 
and it's a sweet little sort of lacy it is slightly lacy pattern and my inspiration was that in the story she's always washing what she calls pocket handkins <laughs> There's always cute names for things in Beatrice Pot Potter, isn't there? And it's basically handkerchiefs, pocket handkerchiefs. I just thought, oh, I'm sure there'll be some pretty lace edged handkerchiefs that she'll be washing. And that thought was in my head. I thought, oh, I want to create something that looks like it might be the little lace that runs along, you know, around the edges of really pretty handkerchiefs. And they were lovely to knit. It's a really sweet little stitch pattern and very pleasant to work and looks brilliant in speckles I think. I think it looks fantastic and that's a trick can be a tricky thing to find to, to get a lace pattern that really looks nice in a speckled yarn because sometimes it can disguise it can't it and I think having these bands of stocking stitch separating the lace I think that helps the lace to, yeah, yeah. to then stand out. Yeah. So the yarn I used is Kelly's yarn from Lay Family Yarns and it was the Lace Hankies sock set. So main colour of this speckle which has got, when I asked her to dye the colourway because we worked on this together and I said oh I want all of the sort, I want really delicately speckled and I want all of the colours that she wears. Not the, there's no yellow, she does have some yellow in like her apron, either her apron or her dress but I didn't really want the yellow in there, I just wanted the kind of fawny tanny sort of colour of the hedgehog and then speckles of pink and blue and I think it's just beautiful and then with a heel that's kind of hedgehoggy really lovely nice so these are part these are the first pattern in my Miss Potter Sock Club which is available on Ravelry you can go and purchase the club it's £12 because the pre-order period is now ended so it's up to its kind of full price that pre-order period ended when the first pattern was launched but it's still only £4 a pattern which I think is good value for money and you know if you like the look of this one then it gives you an idea of the feel of the rest of the collection. There's two more, isn't there? There's two more. The next one is out at the beginning of October and cool. then the final one is the beginning of November. Beautiful. So. Let's get back out to finish off our new adventure. Oh, yes, because there's still so much to discover. My goodness, we have got to go to the new capital of Wensleydale. Wow. And then we've got to stop off at the place where I learned to play golf. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And then finish off in just the most I, I love. Can we have some cheese? I think we should have some cheese. Mm -hmm. So enough talk and more action. And let's get back to new adventures. <laughs> Now, when the plague hit the bustling town of Wensley in 1563, the residents fled. And where did they go to? Well, just a mile up the road from Wensley was a tiny hamlet. And this was the place they turned to. And it's where we're heading right now. It's Lays, just up the road here. So we're going to go and explore the new and undisputed capital of Wensleydale. And that place's name is Leyburn. I've been to Leyburn many times before and it's a big, exciting, vibrant town. Now I know the story of Wensley, you can't help but stop and wonder what might have happened if the plague hadn't hit. This would most probably be a sleepy hamlet like Wensley is now and Wensley would probably be the big market town that Leyburn, the undisputed capital of Wensleydale, has now become. We've actually come to Leyburn on a mission. We are of course in Wensleydale and you know what that means. 
cheese. You would expect that somewhere on this rather original high street, we might find a place where we can purchase Wallace's favorite. Now, why did I call Leyburn's High Street original? Because it has so many independent shops. From its very own department store, featured in a superb BBC documentary from 2008 called Milner's, to its very own independent supermarket, Campbell's, where I have a feeling we might be able to pick up some cheese and crackers for lunch. And I'll tell you what's truly wonderful to see here in Leyburn is a railway station. Because I'm sure many of you will know in the 1960s, so many of the stations that served towns like this were shut. But thanks to the North York Moors Historical Railway Trust, many of the stations across Yorkshire have reopened and we can all enjoy the magic of traveling on a steam train once again. Folks, I don't know about you, but I am absolutely exhausted. So, with cheese and, would you believe it, some fruitcake in hand, I think it's time we got back to the car and had some lunch. We couldn't come to Wensleydale without eating some Wensleydale cheese. And what a lovely shop we got it from. Indeed. It's like an independent grocer's, wasn't it? You don't see shops like that very often. No. Wensleydale cheese. We've got some Wensley... <sighs> can't speak I'm Sorry. so excited and look we even brought a knife and a plate are you impressed with how prepared we are made famous this? of course by Wallace and Gromit really isn't it Wednesday I think that's where the global yes. Yes. success comes I'd, from well I'd uh, probably yeah you're probably right should we try a bit on its own before we have we'll it, try with a bit the on it yeah do that and I'll, I'll I'm hoping this is good stuff I'm it looks wielding. buttery it, it does look buttery it looks very nice it's so mild I mean how could anyone not like that it's very crumbly it's Oh, it's very milky, isn't it? Mm, it's can... lovely. It's like it, it, it's like cheese from days gone by. Do you know what I mean? When I it's oh yeah, proper cheese. Proper, it's proper cheese. Yeah. So should we try a bit with the fruit cake? We this haven't is done perfect. This. We haven't done this since we filmed a. Really, it was as it we was we've actually precursor to the to, to this new adventures, wasn't it? Yeah, you know the the, the Baker Best picnic we picked up along the way some Wednesday Dove. Yeah. And some And some fruit cake. And what did that fruit cake say on it? Did it say it was anything specific or the, this one here? Yeah. It's just when it's from Wensleydale. It's from isn't it? Wensleydale. It's made by J. W. Cockett and Son. Wensleydale Fruitcake. Who were established in 1854. So they must be good. Wensleydale Fruitcake. And it says Wensleydale Creamery up there, so they yeah, must sell they that. They must sell this at Halls. Yeah. Let's give it a go. So let's try it. Oh, it's lovely. Is it lovely? It's the salt with the fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an age-old combination, isn't it? It's absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly filling as well. You know, I think cheese and fruitcake. Oh, gosh, yeah. It really, you know, if you're out on an adventure, like we are today, it's the perfect thing to have. Along the way, there's an awful lot of places where you can get food. Mm. Because we actually got fish and chips. We did? Because it's a fish and chip shop. And to be fair, there's places just like this. Our next destination also has a lot of different places where you could pick up lunch from. Yeah, and there was lots of options here. There was another little supermarket. There's loads of bakers. Mm. So, so what loads. do you think for... Well, I think it's really good. And there were benches around mm. the marketplace. We just did, didn't sit out because... We thought again, we'd look a bit bananas. Eating... Getting out a plate and a yeah. knife. <laughs> and I think I would have been a bit self-conscious. You know what I'm so, like... What do you um, think for picnic ability? I think it's it's pretty good. I'd probably go an eight again. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And there's pubs as well. Mm. Interestability. For 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 labour. No. Oh, the day altogether. Wednesday day. Oh, I think it's been brilliant. I'd probably go a ten. I think it's been great. That's shocking. How could I disagree? Honestly, folks, and we've not finished yet. No. Nope. I've been it, that that screen. In that church. That church was amazing. You know, a 16th century, one that monks would mm. have sat on. Mm. That, it really took my breath away. But yeah. not just that, the story of Wensley. And, you know, tragic, but also, look at it now. Mm. It's an absolutely gorgeous. And I've already said this today, but 
had that plague not hit, mm. would this be the little hamlet that it was? Maybe so. And would Wensley be like this? Yeah. And actually, I think Wensley is better off like it is. Mm. We've got a score of 26. It's not, 26. The, it's not the top, but it's four off the top. It's pretty good. It, Wensleydale is a tremendous place. Mm. There's so much to see and do. There's so many places that you could go and visit. And what the walking is it's phenomenal. It's yeah. just one of the best parts of the world, in my humble opinion. Mm. Our journey is not over. There's one more destination yeah. that we really wanted to stop at today, and that's a place called Beedale. And it's a bit of a drive away, so I think we should get on the road yeah. and see what we can find out about along the way. Yeah, one of the things that I absolutely love about Yorkshire is there's always something interesting on the horizon. And just up here is Akebar Park. Now, it's actually a golf course now, and I know it well because it's the place where I learned to play. But Akebar Park has a secret. The name Akebar is actually of Danish origin, and it is in fact one of Yorkshire's lost villages. This is all that remains of the village, which was settled just before the Viking invasion, when James the Deacon, a disciple of St Paulinus, established an early church right here in the seventh century. But given Akebar's Viking name, it probably grew in size and importance as the other Viking settlement we already visited today, Wensley, was formed further up the dale. The township of Akebar was mentioned in the records of Jervo Abbey in 1290. It remained a grange farm for Jervo, a daughter monastery of the Cistercian Order at Fountains Abbey, until the dissolution of the monasteries around 1530. The abbot and monks of Jervo were well known for their excellent cheese, named Wensleydale, which we of course tried earlier in the show. They were also famous for the breeding of horses of exceptional quality and bravery. It's recorded that a large number of their brood mares were kept right here at Grange Farms at Akebar. And finally, we're about to arrive in our final destination of the day. Welcome, everybody, to the market town of Beedale. Now, those of you who know your geography will know that Beedale isn't actually in Wensleydale. It lies at the end of Wensleydale and at the start of Swaledale, and it's actually considered part of Swaledale. But that didn't stop the councillors here trying to get a geography change in the 1800s. That never happened. But to me, this is the start of Wensleydale, and the majority of the tourists will come through here as they make their way down Wensleydale. So let's get into the town and explore some of the wonderful sites that I know are waiting for us just up this hill. Beedale was granted a market in 1251 AD and the town very quickly grew up around that square and it's changed very, very little since then. In 2012, a group of metal detectorists exploring a field near Beedale discovered an extraordinary hoard of silver and gold objects dating from the 9th and 10th centuries. Amazing stuff. The find was dubbed the Beedale Hoard and it's now on display at the Yorkshire Museum in York. Among the objects were a sword pommel, silver ingots, necklaces and armbands. The presence of the hoard certainly suggests that there was a high status presence in the Beedale area during the Viking period. Yeah. And when you consider Akebar and Wensley's links to the Vikings, it starts to become really clear who's responsible for a lot of what we now enjoy in Wensleydale. The town we see today here in Beedale started life just like Midland did, with the building of a castle, and it sat right there. Now, sadly, that castle has been completely wiped away. And in its place stands this, I mean, it looks pretty good. It's like a mini Chatsworth. You can see that it once would have been rather grand. And trust me when I tell you, it really was rather grand. Palladian style house. Now I had a shock when I was researching the castle which this house replaced, because it turns out the man who built it, Sir Brian Fitz Allen, also built a manor on the outskirts of York called Ascombe Brian. 
That's now a tiny village, very similar to Wensley, and I know it well, because that's where I grew up. Sir Brian famously fought against William Wallace in the Scottish Wars of Independence, and he's actually buried in St Gregory's Church, just over the road from his old castle. So let's see if we can find him. This is it, St Gregory's Church, and the first thing that stands out to me is that tower. It dates from the 1330s, and it was actually built as a defensive structure. It even had a portcullis, so if the town was attacked, the residents could retreat inside the church and drop the portcullis to protect themselves. The tower was paid for by Sir Brian's wife, Matilda, and it was done actually to really memorialize him following his death. St Gregory's contains one of the oldest ringable bells in England. It weighs 2,900 pounds. It was installed in 1360 and it's known as the Gervo Bell as it was actually gifted to St Gregory's from the nearby Gervo Abbey. After the dissolution of the monasteries, one of Gervo Abbey's windows was also installed and there it is. Just stunning for me to see things from another of the abbeys, which we visited for many years and loved as a ruin. And, you know, to, to see something as if it were still there today, it's like stepping back in time. And there on the right is the remains of the tomb of Sir Brian Fitz Allen, the man who's brought us here today and the man who, unbelievably for me, gave his name to the village where I spent the first 18 years of my life. What a fascinating place and the perfect end to the story of probably the most famous of all the Yorkshire Dales. From its earliest roots with the arrival of the Romans at Midlam, to the story of the little village with its stunning church which gave the dale its name. Wensleydale has proved itself to be without doubt our favourite of all the Yorkshire Dales. And to think the journey to get us here to this stunning countryside that is the whole of the Yorkshire Dales started 280 million years ago at the bottom of the sea. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time for more new adventures of the Bakery Bears. Oh yes, my goodness, what a... Do you know what? I loved that. Mm, I loved it too. It was We've been building up to that the whole series. Oh, have we? What a series it's been. I was thinking that when I was editing this up. Do you know what? We made some changes at the start of this year. We really Every year we try and up production values. And we really push the boat out with regards to new adventures and with Pudding Club. And I just think it's transformed what we're able to do when we're mm, out filming. Mm. And it's just... It's just wonderful stuff. It really yeah. is. You know, that really just great. brought together because we've not, we've never been able to get those in motion shots before. Right. So, you know, to give that sort of, to do a proper road trip, you need to get the feel of the journey which we're going mm. on. And mm. so being able to do that, you know, really for me, it really brought things together. Yeah. And also, as well, yeah. when you're traveling through the Dales, you need to see the beautiful mm. fields with the, you know, the, the, oh, the hay bales are just beautiful useful at this time of year aren't they I love yeah. it so, you know some, I, I often say because some are square well not square some are rectangular and yeah. some are circular aren't they yeah. and I, I often think I wonder how a farmer decides whether they're going to have circular ones or rect rectangles well, it probably comes down to a lot of things, but I, I would guess that cost... the machinery is more expensive for the circular Well, I've got ones. no idea. People out there probably know. Yeah, maybe. But if you do know why farmers choose one or the it other... It might be cost, but also it might be what it's going to be used for. Yeah, because obviously rectangles are easier to stack, aren't they? Yeah, they're also easier to throw out for people. Right. You know, For and people? Well, all for right. For animals. Then, for animals and spread out. <laughs>
So it really, I suppose it just, mm. just depends. But marvellous, just marvellous to see those beautiful. types of things. Yeah, yeah, it's a really beautiful time of year. Neil, you know what that means? It means next time, in episode 134, Kay is back for the final pudding club of the season. Ah. Oh. So that means it's going to be an absolute corker. You do not want to mm. miss this. I'm excited. As we come to the end of the Pudding Club season and the New Adventures season, I don't want you to be downhearted because we have some surprises in store for you this year and that's all I'm going to say about that. Mm. All will be revealed as the episodes continue. Mm. Probably episode 135 will might what are we number on now? Drop some hints. 133. Right, okay. Folks, it's time for the Andy bits. Andy bits? Neil, we've already spoken about the Miss Potter 2. We, we have, but there's one other thing I, know, I wanted to that's mention. That's why I brought it up. Oh, right, okay. There's one other thing I wanted to mention about that. And a few people had asked me about whether there's a knit along. There is a knit along, but I'm doing it in a very casual way. I really love the way that the swish and flick knit along has been going. And, you know, if you're participating in that sort of chatter and FO thread on Ravelry, you'll you'll just appreciate the kind of energy that's around it. And I wanted to do a similar sort of thing with the Miss Potter. So I've opened thread, but there's only one thread. So you can chatter away in that thread. You can talk about your yarns. You can post pictures of your progress but you can also put your FOs in that thread as well so it does it does explain it all when you actually look at it on the you know the details and then what I'll do is I'll announce it on the podcast that goes out on the 6th of December so I'll let the the knit along run until the end of November the last pattern comes out at the beginning of November so I'll give it all of that month and then at the beginning of December I'll pull for some prizes from that thread so if you've been in there chattering away loads then you'll stand more of a chance of winning a prize and I, I just really like like I say, I, I liked the inform, informality of just having the one thread where you can all just pile in and you can all chatter and you can post your finished objects and, you know, everybody then stands as much of a chance of winning a prize, even if you've not quite finished your socks, yeah, yeah. you still stand a chance. Yeah. So that's my plans for that and that's underway. And y- you mentioned there that you've really been enjoying how the Swish and Flick has been going. Yeah. When's the next pattern for the Swish and Flick due out? The next pattern for the Swish and Flick, what date are we on You there? don't know, do you? Off the top of my head, I don't know the exact date, no, but it's towards the end of this month. Right. The next pattern for the Swish and Flick will come out then, because <laughs> she doesn't know. It's not acceptable. I have lots of dates to remember in my head. So the next pattern will be out then, and also along with that pattern, there'll be the next chapter in Clementine's story. Yeah. And you can, of course, keep getting involved, yep. just like you'll be able to do with the Miss Potter, yep. with the cow that's ongoing. Yep. Yes, Absolutely. that's brilliant. Yeah, and I'll be drawing for another prize for the Swish and Flick when the next pattern comes out, as I've been doing, and it'll be another one of the skeins of yarn that I dyed up, and another one of the lovely bags from Sasha. Cool. Tell us about the new cow. Right. We thought it was time we had a full-on knit-along. When I say full-on because, you know, the ones we've got ongoing at the minute are specific, aren't they? And this, we wanted this to be, you know, everybody can join in and really to be inspired by the fact that we're just coming into autumn, which I know is a lot of people's favourite season. Yes. And it just... Oh, fills me with joy. Yes. And I thought, right, okay, do you know what? Let's start a really fun knit along for the whole of autumn. The theme for this knit along, I'll tell you the name of it and then you will you'll know what the, the sort of subject matter is. And the knit along is yeah. going to be called the Autumn Equisox knit along. Jumpers. Do you get it? Ignore, <laughs> ignore the fall to my left. No, the Autumn Equisox cow. Hats. No. <laughs> so it's going to be a sock knit along. Right. And this knit along is going to run from the autumn equinox, which is the 23rd of September. So it's not that long, really. No. I think it's like 8 a.m. in the morning, the actual equinox. Um, so it'll be. So from... any entries before that will not be accepted. No, but 
you but I, we will accept whips in this i'll talk about that in a second so yeah it's going to run from the 23rd of september which is the autumn equinox and it's going to finish on the day of the winter solstice Wednesday. which is the 22nd of december excellent so we just thought that was really lovely you know it incorporates the whole of autumn we can all enjoy knitting loads of autumnal socks they don't have to be autumn themed specifically you know you can knit any socks you want to but it needs to be an adult pair of socks because you know baby socks just can be knit up in a flash can't they so yeah. let's stick with adult socks you can like i said you can so it's adult socks works in progress are fine as long as you've only knit a maximum of one sock right. so no more than 50 percent finished right. as long as you haven't cast on the second sock then you can include works in progress cool now for this one i am going to have two threads I'm going to open a chatter thread and I will open a finished object thread for this one because I kind of feel like there might be a lot of finished objects. Yes. I hope there will be anyway for this. It's quite a long knit along, you know, yes. it's three months almost. And I just feel like there will be quite a lot of finished socks that will be in there. So I, felt, I thought for this one it will be easier to have them separate. So you'll be able to go over to Ravelry and see the chatter thread now. And then I'll open a finished objects thread as soon as the knit along sort of launches on the 23rd. Now there will be some prizes. So far I've dyed up the... I've got the rainbow set that I showed you, I'm gonna use that as a prize. And I called the colorway rainbow mitts because that's what I'm knitting with them. I thought that was quite sweet, but obviously you can do whatever you want with them. You don't have to knit mitts. So I've got those lovely set, that lovely set of minis. And then I've also got this sock set that I dyed up a little while ago. I said I wanted to use a set of it as a prize and the colors just seem perfect again for autumn. And I called this the Autumn Gold Sock Set. So you get 100 grams of that beautiful gold colour and then a 20 gram mini of the pink. And it just kind of reminds me of autumnal sunrises and sunsets where you get, you're still getting that pinky colour in the sky, but then you're also getting lots of golds. And I put it on a lovely pink band, which I thought was nice. So that's two of the prizes I've got. There may well be other prizes as we go along, but that's the ones I've got so far. What I thought would also be fun is for the, because this is it's a sock knit along, what I'm going to do is for the duration of the knit along, I'm going to discount all of my sock patterns by 15%. So from the 23rd of September to the 22nd of December, all of my sock patterns will be 15% 15, 15 off. You don't need to enter a code, it will just automatically give you that discount. This will include because I've got quite a lot of sock patterns that will be dropping into the individual downloads within that period. So on the 4th of November, the three Miss Potter sock club patterns will be going up as individual downloads. Those three patterns will be included within the discount. And then on the 1st of December, all of the sock designs from my Swish and Flick will be going as individual downloads. So again, those ones will be discounted from when they're released to the end of the knit along. So at the moment, I've got nine sock patterns cool. available on Ravelry. But when all of those others go, I'll have 16 sock patterns available on Ravelry, which I'm really pleased with that. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a great, I think it just reflects what I love to design, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I'm really pleased to be building up my little sort of yes. sock catalogue that's yeah. available for purchase. And when I put out the individual patterns for the Miss Potter and for the Swish and Flick, they will also be going in my Etsy shop and in Love Crafts. Yeah. I almost said Love Knitting, Love Crafts. And remember, as well. the best place to find all of Kay's patterns and where they're available is on our website on the pattern page, yeah. which is linked in the show notes below. Yeah, so I know that was a whole lot of information, but I'll put all of what I've just said into the chatter thread on Ravelry so you can go over and you can read everything that I've just said just so that you, you know, you can absorb it a little bit better. Cool. Is that you? But done? fun. But what I'm going to do for the knit along? Do you want to want? Do you want to know? I've started. You just zipped your bag up. I did. I zipped it up on my excitement. I've gathered together, or I am in the process of gathering together some minis and scraps 
to do a scrappy pair of autumnal socks. Look, I've got all these so far. Ooh, cool. lovely. Cool. I'm going to do them for Dan. That's what I'm going to be doing, a scrappy pair of autumnal socks, because there's nothing better, is there, than scrappy socks. No, I agree. They go so quick, yeah. and it's just fun, and yeah. so that's going to be my project for the knit along. Anything else from you? I've just got one more thing. Is that okay? And I purchased another one of Sherry Iris's minis, minis club. This is the August club, and it's based on wildflowers. And I will show you. Oh, they come in these lovely little bags, and I still can't bring myself to use the other one. <laughs> this one is June. Haven't used it yet, can't bring myself to use it. And then I missed July, but then I did get August. And look, look, I think Sherry dyed these just for me because they're all these beautiful pinks and lemons and a little bit of peach. Just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. I, I love them and she always puts in like lots of little bits of information and what her inspiration was. And there's always a lovely stitch marker. This one's gorgeous, it's got like a, can you see there's like a little flower inside that bead? Just beautiful. And I really want to do something with these by themselves. So, and I've just ordered as well Septembers of these. I'm probably gonna keep getting them every month because I just love them. And I really want to do something with them all together. So I've got kind of blanket thoughts in my head of having like a Sherry Iris blanket. I'm not quite sure what type yet. But they're just such they're just such beautiful yarns. I just I just love looking at them. So that's why I haven't been able to bring myself to use them. But I am. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do some kind of blankets, I think. Cool. Next week, Baker Bears Radio Show episode six. Don't miss it, be out on Friday. Also, there's loads of oh, knitability also. Knitability, because of the launch of the radio show and some late submissions on some articles, that our last issue was delayed. It will be out next week, so don't miss that. Also, uh, Kay starts a brand new tutorial series next week on Ooh. cabling. Cabling. Plus, the cake show is back over the next couple of weeks. I think it's the week after next. Oh, that's excellent it, actually. news. We've not had a cake for ages. I know, and I'll have the latest edition of the yoke show, but that is not next week, but the week after as well. But before we finish, I just also must mention that the One Moment in Time socks, the last Platinum Collection socks... For this year. For this year, yeah. prior to the launch of the 2020 collection. Yeah, which is always, like, Christmas Eve. So the 24th of December, the 2020 Platinum Collection will launch. Yeah. The final pattern in the collection became available at the start of this month. Yeah. It's the One Moment in Time socks. And you can find out all about these socks on our website here, but they are just gorgeous. They are gorgeous. And do you know what I'm going to do? I thought the other day that I've got all of the, all of the socks that I've been knitting. You can see the other two pairs. These are the other two Swish and Flick that have come out so far. I haven't, you know, worn these or given them to Bryony or anything yet. And I've obviously got some more coming out before the end of the year. And I thought, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to bundle up all of these socks in a big mountain and give them to Bryony for Christmas. Woohoo! I think it's going to be hilarious. Oh, you know, that. she'll open them and she'll go, oh! Yeah, yeah. And I think there'll be seven. There'll be yeah. like seven pairs of socks. But I think that's, you know, to do that is... It's got more, much more impact, hasn't it? Yeah. Than if I'd just given her the socks every time Absolutely. I finished a pair. Yeah, yeah. I think for her to open them, because she wears her hand knit socks every single day. You know, she she loves them, and I, I would rather she have them. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm saving them all. I'm going to wrap them all up beautiful for her. So the One Moment in Time socks, of course, are part of the Platinum Collection. They're available free to gold and platinum patrons. Yeah. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in two weeks for episode 134. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Not quitting for men and cable maker repairs. They'll take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a baker repair. You'll find yourself in a castle while watching the baker repairs. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the baker repairs. Sign your shelf for what?